Thank you very much and uh, good evening. And um, I have a uh, high task here because I hear this is the 18th uh, leadership uh, talk. And we've had, uh, you've had mountain climbers and astronauts and um, political figures. So uh, quite, uh, quite an interesting challenge here. Um, what, what I'm going to do today is to uh, give you a story from a personal perspective of human papillomavirus and um, how I came to uh, develop HPV testing and subsequently methylation testing. Uh, you know, it's... Uh, so I don't have any um, uh, disclosures, uh, just to make it clear. And um, I have little anecdotes related to leadership uh, throughout my talk, and a very famous one um, comes from Louis Pasteur, which is that serendipity only favors the prepared mind. And I think that's pretty important uh, to lay the uh, foundation and the groundwork for making sure that uh, you're ready for whatever challenge that you're um, setting yourself for. So a little bit about my history, because a number of people have asked me, um, where am I from? Where did I get my accent? Um, so forth. And uh, so really in the beginning, there was, uh, of course, Lorenz, which is originally Saint Lorenz, uh, and he was um, a cult figure. He was martyred in Rome. And then, of course, there was Attila, who uh, loved to uh, pillage and kill people. And um, he achieved cult status because he uh, spared Rome for a suitable payment of gold. So already I had my um, hero set up for me, you know. Um, both a uh, saint and a sinner here. Uh, I'm a Hungarian uh, refugee. Many of you may or may not, you may know uh, Alex Ferenczi. Um, and Alex also is a 1956 refugee. And um, so we escaped the Ruskies in 1956. My parents uh, evacuating me to Ireland. Um, the, uh, the island of saints and scholars, so at least one part of the background was suitable there. And Alex actually grew up on the mean streets of Paris, uh, or so he says, and eventually got his uh, MD from the Sorbonne. So, uh, you know, we, we all come in different shapes and sizes. While in Ireland, um, I did have a chance at some fame uh, my wife reminds me of this story, Joan, who's uh, uh, very important in my life. Um, and uh, at one point, U2, uh, many of you probably know U2 or you've heard of U2, the rock band. They were, uh, they were practicing in the garage down the street from where Joan lived. Uh, and uh, I was her boyfriend at the time, and I, I was in a rock band too, and I didn't think they were any good. Um, <laughs> And they, uh, they wanted me to give them advice and become their manager. And um, I said, nah, you know, these, these guys don't have it. So, <laughs> so, so much for making good choices. <laughs> so much for, okay, what did I end up doing? I, I got a PhD in uh, classical and molecular genetics at uh, Trinity College, Dublin, Ireland. And, and one, my main examiner was, um, Paul Nurse, or Paul Nurse, who won the Nobel Prize uh, for cloning the human uh, versions of the uh, CDK uh, genes which uh, control the cell cycle. And actually what I did was I uh, first identified the yeast versions of CDK, which were about 10 years before he did his mammalian work. Uh, subsequently, PhD in San Diego, that uh, very interesting spaceship-like thing is the uh, library. It's an amazing building, and um, I was with Professor Gaidashek, also uh, quite well known, and uh, we were doing uh, various kinds of uh, 
proteomics analysis. That's what they're called now. Back then, we just called them 2D, two-dimensional gel electrophoresis. Um, but, you know, everything has become omics now, and it's certainly a very um, sexy approach. So why did I get interested in HPV? Um, well, HPV is um, an interesting virus. Uh, many of them are sexually transmissible. Um, and uh, it just seemed like an interesting thing to study. Uh, so uh, also leadership, coming to leadership, it's being in the right place at the right time. I think that uh, a healthy dose of leadership, the leader will recognize that look does have an important role to play. And you have to take advantage of it. And in my case, uh, it was meeting Professor Harold Zurhausen, who won the 2008 Nobel Prize in Medicine for his work on papillomavirus. And there was a conference at Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory, beautiful place, uh, where we also had um, Sir Richard Dahl and uh, Tom, uh, Tom Pito and all of those, um, the Oxford Coterie of Statisticians, Epidemiologists, uh, Richard Dahl, of course, uh, the first discovered the relationship between smoking and lung cancer, uh, which finally got uh, everybody um, on board at the effects of that. And so um, an important point of leadership also is to take time to contemplate and to set your course. You have to decide what you want to do um, in order, I think, to be a good leader uh, for yourself you have to have a clear focus. So I think that that was an important point. And we established a collaboration, uh, which was great. Uh, Professor Zurhausen, uh, some colleagues from Georgetown University in Washington, DC, and originally um, Digene, uh, actually it was called Bethesda Research Lab. So that's kind of when I went into the, um, uh, the industrial uh, sector. And of course, that was in 1984, I'm not kidding, and that's, what, that's when uh, George Orwell's story 1984 was based, which was a dystopian tale. And, and uh, Digene experienced uh, a lot of the horror as well, so we kind of felt we were part of the story for a while. Um, so cervical cancer. Um, this was the main thing um, that I was involved with for a long time. And it's, um, you know, in the early years, it was the second cancer. Um, it's subsequently gone to fourth place, um, uh, but uh, still quite, uh, quite common, especially worldwide. And uh, so it um, bears taming. Uh, the human papillomavirus is the major cause of cervical cancer, but um, it's only a driver. There's many other cofactors. Uh, I'd also add that um, you can add a, uh, a goodly proportion of anogenital cancer, oropharyngeal cancer, and of course, some amount of vulval penile vaginal to that as well. Um, and at the time uh, when I was getting involved with uh, the human papillomavirus work with uh, Professor Zurhausen, um, the, 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 big, the big honcho was Dr. Uh, Papanicolaou the pap smear. Uh, and, you know, that was a, uh, a, an amazing challenge, of course, because um, since a uh, lo very long time he was involved in promoting this. It, it was a wonderful test and responsible for a huge life, a uh, huge number of lives saved. Um, however, there were a number of limitations that we understood at the point. Sensitivity isn't very high. Uh, and it's also not prognostic. So I guess Attila and his hordes arrived to do battle with uh, Dr. Papa Nicolaou. Uh, and I didn't realize at the time how big of a battle it was going to be uh, because all we wanted to do was come along with a test that uh, cytologists and pathologists would use. Uh, the aim was to make for a better and more accurate um, test to complement the pap smear. Um, but uh, it didn't quite uh, work out that way. Uh, so the philosophy of the HPV test uh, is that predominantly uh, 
people who are not infected with HPV, or women who are not infected with HPV, certainly with cervical cancer, are not at high risk of the disease because uh, HPV is a, um, almost a uh, totally necessary predisposing risk factor although we're coming to recognize that uh, it's not quite 100%, it's probably more like 90 to 95%. Um, but that was good enough at the time. So um, really the, the, the point is leadership really ha uh, involves a lot of hard work um, and uh, you need to build a team of people who genuinely want to join you and help in the vision. Or as uh, Dwight Eisenhower said, it's the art of getting people to want to do what must be done. So you can't be a leader on your own. Really, you have to have a group who shares the vision. And all of you need to be focused. Um, and that's what was required. And I'd like to step you through a little bit of um, some of the problems in diagnostics at the time. And I think these still exist today. When we look at a typical big company, um, they tend to have what I would call a copycat strategy. And that's not to be demeaning, but they, what they do is you can see them buying small companies. They don't tend to do a whole lot of um, groundbreaking research and they don't have, uh, let's say, the, uh, the desire to be groundbreaking because it, the money comes from getting uh, regulatory approvals and getting out in the market. Um, whereas a startup, which is where I was working, had to be involved in all sorts of things, creating the market, uh, you know, um, obviously sponsoring clinical trials, and afterwards, because uh, this wasn't, let's say, on the minds of everybody, create the market. So we weren't going for an immediately existing need. We were creating a need, uh, and you can see that in the trajectory of HPV testing because, you know, UK is implementing HPV testing now, Canada is implementing it now. Well, gosh, that's 30 years later. Um, so really it can take a very, very long time. And so leadership does require, or maybe, you know, maybe this is silliness, but it can also be leadership, be willing to um, go in your own direction. And basically, um, not take no for an answer. You have to trust enough in your own instincts that eventually this will work. Um, and uh, so, you know, my way of um, uh, attempting to tame HPV was in a startup uh, because at the time, Roche wasn't interested in it, Abbott wasn't interested in it, none of the drug companies were interested, they didn't want to have anything to do with it. And why was that? Um, I'll get to that in a minute. So what did I have to do? Well, HPV 16 and 18 were provided by Professor Zurhausen, but as we know, they're responsible for roughly 70% of the invasive cancers. So what about the other 30%? Well, there's HPV 31, 33, 35, you know, on up through the list. So I had to clone all of those other types. Uh, basically, it was me and... Um, a gentleman called uh, Gerard Orth from the Pasteur Institute, um, who unfortunately has been almost forgotten, but he did an incredibly important job, and he ran the HPV, the Papillomavirus Reference Center. And you had to send your clones to him and work out with him, and we decided as a group, is this a new virus type, or is it just an old virus type? Uh, and so there was that. Uh, in 1992, I published a paper on characterizing and separating HPV types into the low risk, 6 and 11, 42, 43, 44 other types, uh, the high risk, certainly 16, 18, 45, and then the intermediate risk, uh, which would be your 31, 33, 35. These tend to be, for simplicity, grouped into high risk, but they're not. Uh, all high risk because, in fact, the risk of cancer and the risk of outcome in women from different infections is different. So genotyping is actually quite important. And the 
intermediate risk types tend to show up in older women, whereas the 16s and the 18s tend to show up in the younger women. That's not exclusive. There's plenty of older women with 16 and 18, but I'm just talking about a somewhat predominance. You're not going to see a whole lot of invasive cancers with 31 or 35 in young women. They wait much longer than 10 years. There was a thing called the viropap.blot test. It got approved for FDA approval in 1988. Can you believe? But um, it had a number of limitations, and this was a commercial decision, and the sales and marketing guys said, we're going to run with a test that has 611, 16, 18, 31, 33, 35, and it didn't work. Uh, for obvious reasons. I mean, it was used for many years. Firstly, it didn't have enough high-risk HPV types. And secondly, it was mixing uh, low-risk types with high-risk types. And Mark Schiffman had a field day with this going after it and, you know, basically saying how bad it was. And uh, basically, it was, it, was, it was true. Hybrid Capture 2 came along in 1996. Uh, and then was approved for routine screening by the FDA in 2003. And that had the 13 high-risk HPV types that are part of every PCR cocktail today. And this was a signal amplification test. Still used, um, but uh, is, its, its star is slowly uh, fading as um, more automated technologies come to bear. Um, Another HC2, of course, was the Army Chinook HC2, and I wish I'd discovered this because it was a lot more financially rewarding, I'm sure, for the people who um, came up with this HC2, but uh, there you are. Um, so leadership, believe in opposition, and um, go and do what you need to do if you must uh, against the opposition. And where were we in 1990? Now, that's, not, that's a long time ago, relatively speaking, um, 20 years ago. Uh, HPV, there, there were a huge, I would say the majority of people did not believe that HPV caused cervical cancer. What did they believe? They believed, as uh, um, Peyton Rouse got in his face even from his amazing experiments, a virus can't cause cancer. No virus can cause cancer. You know, well, okay, what caused it? Well, maybe it was chlamydia. Some people said, well, it could be an infectious agent. Maybe herpes. Uh, there were some people saying that spermatozoa would cause cancer. Well, and it's not that outrageous because, you know, it does kind of, I don't know how it gets to the, well, it can get to the cervix. It goes into the egg. But anyway, they thought that sperm might cause it. Uh, and then a lot of people said cause unknown, but definitely not HPV. So things, boy, things have changed a lot. Um, so the timeline of translational medicine is not short. Look at this timeline. This is a 20-year 20, uh, 20 timeline from the discovery of HPV-16 in Harold Zurhausen's team to the uh, seminal paper by Jan Wahlboomers in 1999 um, showing that HPV causes most cervical cancers. Uh, you know, perhaps not 99 like he found, but certainly very, very high. Uh, going further again, you know, there were a number of papers with Mark Schiffman and myself, the ALTS trial, Diane Solomon, and then, as I mentioned, the FDA approval in 2003 of hybrid capture 2. And along the way, we also discovered that um, uh, there's a relationship between the female cervix and Mick Jagger. Um, speaking, speaking about Mick, he's actually doing quite well after his heart surgery. And uh, he was seen in New York at the Lincoln Center with his 32-year-old girlfriend, Melanie. So obviously he's doing something right, guys, you know, I mean, but I guess. <laughs> All right. Um, so liquid cytology was a tremendous barrier to HPV testing. Uh, because liquid-based cytology was the answer to uh, cyto cytopathologists' dreams. However, um, in the end, it turned out not to have very much greater of a sensitivity than the conventional uh, smeared slide. 
So um, how did HPV finally start to get the upper hand? This is a listing of the randomized controlled trials, the individuals who um, uh, the principal investigators. There were a large number, one from Canada, um, actually two from Canada, one by Eduardo Franco on the recent Focal trial, uh, a lot in Europe. Uh, and uh, the bottom line was that HPV testing was more sensitive than cytology by at least 60 to 70 percent. And you can see at the bottom there the average improvement on this forest plot for HPV versus a first round cytology. So I think that that went a long way. Also, this study with um, uh, Mark Schiffman and Phil Castle and myself, uh, published by uh, Khan et al., showed the cumulative incidence of CIN3 uh, plus um, over, a, uh, over a period of about uh, 12 years. And you can see HPV-16 was the most aggressive virus, uh, showing a very high incidence there over that time of over 30%. HPV-18, then these other types, and of course the HPV negatives. Um, not free, as you can see, it didn't stay zero, but you know, these people may well have become infected later. And of course, there's the probability that maybe 5 or 10% of the cancers are caused by epigenetic defects in which HPV may play a hit and run role or may not be involved at all. And finally, some protection data. Uh, the green line is the, well, let's just focus on the red line. That's the protection from an HPV negative test whereas the blue line is the protection from a cytology negative test. And on the y-axis, you can see the cumulative incidence rate. And basically what it shows is that a, a negative HPV test gives two to three times the length of protection from a cervical precancer or cancer as a negative cytology. So what can it do? It can lengthen the screening intervals at the same or better protection, which saves money and, you know, people kind of like that. Uh, 2002 ASCCP came out in support of HPV testing. Uh, there was evidence-based uh, medicine. Sue Goldie from Harvard came out and said uh, HPV testing is actually cost-effective. And finally, ACOG, American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology, came out with their practice bulletins. Um, and at the time, and still mainly promote co-testing, which is HPV testing combined with cytology. Cytology adds a little bit to HPV in terms of sensitivity, but um, in practice, it's probably not cost-effective, and most of Europe is doing HPV primary screening. UK, certainly the Netherlands, Scandinavian countries. You do an HPV test first, the interval is typically five years, although uh, in the Nether Netherlands they have staggered intervals where they lengthen it once they know you're negative. Uh, and cytology is used as the triage or the follow-up test. Those are the strategies that are happening there. And here's a little ad. Uh-oh. Right, we, right, oh, here of we course. Are. Wrong. A pap isn't enough. There's another test, the HPV test. Almost all cervical cancers are caused by a virus, the human papillomavirus. And only an HPV test can directly detect the virus. Really? Why didn't I know that? Now you know. And everyone we know should know. Absolutely. The HPV test. Ask your doctor, tell your friends. Must be used along with a pap test and is approved for screening women 30 and over. So what did we do in the 19, late 1990s, early 2000s? Digene sponsored a TV ad. And, um, you know, a lot of people didn't like it. You know, you're not supposed to be doing that. But um, so this was back in the quaint days when you're not supposed to be advertising to patients. But this was practically one of the first diagnostics. It cost six million dollars to run those ads across the US. So it's not cheap to, to do that, but it resulted in a huge uptake despite the negative publicity because at the time the 
uh, family practitioners who were seeing the women were recommending pap smears and not HPV. It didn't matter. Don't show me the data. My mind is made up. And so I think what finally led to it was the key opinion leaders, you know, Walter Kinney, Mark Schiffman, saying, look, you got to do this, plus going to the women. They started asking for it. Um, so, uh, you know, crass commercialism does have its place uh, in terms of getting the information out when it's important and you just got to do it. Here's, uh, you know, uh, Dijin lobbied the uh, German parliament at the Reichstag and that actually worked to get it into Germany as well, uh, you know, a balloon release. So what is required to get a groundbreaking diagnostic into routine practice when um, the medical community actually doesn't know that it wants it. Okay, so that's actually a bigger challenge than, uh, you know, I want this for my patient because I uh, have it. Well, there's a whole bunch of stuff that you have to do. Some of it is kind of unsavory. You have to, you know, for, you have to sponsor all these big trials. You have to sponsor uh, key opinion leaders talking. Um, you have to talk to the insurance companies to make sure that they um, actually will support it. You have to do various kinds of advertising. Uh, you have to follow up afterwards with experiences uh, with the doctor. So it's a complicated path. Um, if you want to start from the beginning, it's probably today you still need to do something like that. As a, you know, if you've got a great idea and it is not mainstream, and you think that this is something that everybody will need, it's going to be a torturous path. Okay, so uh, where are we now? 2019, um, you know, we're still on the path um, to taming HPV, but we're not there yet. There's a long, long way to go still. Um, just a little bit on uh, poor regions. Um, that's where the major uh, disease problem is. And I would uh, propose to you that uh, urine and self-sampling is going to be very, very important. For one thing, the women like it a lot. And secondly, it's come a huge way. It's virtually as good as a clinician sampling. Not quite, but it really opens up the possibility to a lot of different things. The sample is stable. You can take it in the remote area fly it into a central lab or maybe run a simple test there and um, eventually identify the people who are highly at risk. Um, and I did a partnership with Pat uh, in Seattle and Bill Gates uh, and we created a test. So here's Bill Gates looking at the CARE HPV test uh, in Seattle and it's this little test that can be run in remote regions uh, it's being run a fair bit in China and Asia and so forth. Uh, here is a farmer's daughter running the CARE HPV test in China. And um, it has been trialed in a number of countries with very nice results. Uh, Nicaragua, uh, Rwanda, uh, and a couple of different places in India. And it's pretty well established uh, now. So what's next? Okay, um, well, HPV has an unfortunate problem. It's a very, very common virus. Hundreds and hundreds of millions of people are infected with it, um, and only a very small percentage are at risk of cancer. So what you need is something else. Genotyping is certainly useful. Cytology you can use as a triage. DNA methylation is what I've been interested in recently. Um, because DNA methylation is a very important pillar of epigenetics. And epigenetics is really the study of the patterning of the human body from a single fertilized cell to an adult, because that's all epigenetics. There's, ver there's no mutation that goes on, you know, other than passenger mutations in our cells, which actually put us at risk of disease. In theory, if we were perfect organisms, we would have every single identical ACTG as we had as a fertilized egg. But epigenetic patterning is hugely important and every organ in your body has a different epigenetic patterning. And when that goes awry, 
there's big problems. Uh, it's involved in lots and lots of different things. And it's involved in cancer, no surprise. Virtually all of the cancers that I've looked at, and it's really in the literature, virtually all of the cancers are positive, are highly positive for methylation markers. Um, and a quantitative methylation test has a very nice utility. So it's not just hypo versus hypermethylated. A quantitative methylation test can tell you roughly how far away that person is from the malignancy. And we've shown that in the focal trial. Now it's, I'm not saying it's perfect, but you know, if you've got a high level of methylation in signature genes, you can be pretty sure you're well on the way to a malignancy somewhere in that organ. So future dream, you know, and I think this will probably become a reality um, in the not too distant future, but it's going to take a while for regulatory approvals. Uh, let's say just for cervical cancer in this case, okay, we're, we're keeping it to that vision. Uh, you do an HPV test, if the HPV test is negative and it's a good, highly sensitive test, and with methylation you could run HPV testing even more sensitively than it's being run today, because you don't worry about the specificity to the quite extent. Rescreen in 10 years. If the methylation is positive, you do a methylation test. If that's positive, go straight to colposcopy. And if the methylation is negative, you would continue to um, survey that person until they either become HPV negative or until you see that methylation test either going up or plateauing and going down. So we'll give you a signature for the timeline of that methylation risk. Why does a teller have an Irish accent? Well, you can blame the Guinness and of course my history having, uh, having grown up in Ireland. Um, so with that, uh, I would thank you very much. There's some mountains. I actually took that myself from the Himalayas. Although I'm not a mountain climber, I got pretty close up to about 6,000 meters almost. Um, so that's my, that's my mountain shot. Thank you very much. So I just, uh, perhaps, uh, a, a, I'd like to uh, give you a, a, a certificate as the uh, leadership lecturer to official ranks. Thank, well, you, thank you, thank you very much. Oh. Come on, come on. Maybe you can tell us the story behind that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. Um, well, what's the biggest barrier to eradication of cervical cancer, I would say, is um, uh, obviously money. Um, why do I say that? Because Education follows from money, and education is highly in need um, to teach people how to manage this properly, get young people vaccinated, you know, get the daughters vaccinated when they're young enough, get the mother screened, uh, and, um, uh, you know, money can um, cover a lot of sins, you know, corruption drains a lot of money off in uh, Africa and places in Asia as well, so really money, money is it, and that's probably, that's probably the uh, simple answer for a lot of other things as well. Uh, I hate to say, um, this tie, my wife Joan sitting over here bought me this tie, and um, I'm a golfer, my son is quite good, and I, I kind of end up in the rough a lot. So this was in, in recognition of early uh, golfing uh, victims of bad shots and bogeys and things. So um, she bought that for me and said, maybe this will give you a better golf game. And I says, I'm not going to wear that out on the course, you know, I mean, can you, can you imagine? So it's a, it's a golfing tie from uh, back, back in the days when they used wooden sticks. Michael. Oh, sorry, Michael. Yeah, so one question. The, as a leader in that journey, a very fantastic journey, thanks for sharing it. When you had a vision, when you were in a, a place where nobody was believing you and you were alone, or you were clearly pushing uphill, what did you draw on to continue? Um, you must have 
What did I draw on? I drew on my stubbornness and obstinacy um, and the support of my family um, and uh, being a fairly good loner if I have to be. So I, you know, basically said, I think I'm right and, you know, everybody may t tell me I'm a fool, but I'm just not going to give up. And I think that worked. And I have to say, uh, Professor Zurhausen thought I was foolish and thought that um, diagnostics wasn't going to fly. The pap smear was just so good and such of a strong opposition. And he always believed in the vaccine. Um, so he turned out to be half right. Uh, diagnostics is very important and I just stuck to my guns. Even when in the 1990s when I was like uh, six to eight years into it, he said, you know, I think you're wasting your time. And I, I said, with all due respect, professor, I called him Harold, of course, um, I'm going to continue. You know, I've, I've, I've done too much. So yeah, I think you do have to be stubborn. Um, as I alluded to there, you have to be pretty sure you're right. You know, I was, I was a bit cocky, but I thought I, thought I was right. Um, and that I just had a, um, a vision of this. I read voraciously, which might be difficult for those who have busy medical practices. I was a research guy, and I read, I read everything that I could, even if it wasn't related to my primary interest, because I never would know where I would find something that was a gem. And actually, I think that helped me. Uh, so even now, I review papers all over the place because I think reviewing papers actually makes you into a better person. You understand what the flaws of research are. And I urge everybody who gets papers to try to be good reviewers because it teaches you a lot. And I did that back then as well. Yes. Did, did, does the PCR test have to be updated frequently to take account of viral evolution? That's the question. And the answer is no. Um, and the reason for that is that HPV is a double-stranded DNA virus. It's small. It's very highly conserved. Um, and there, there is forced upon it a efficiency a genetic efficiency, and it, it doesn't mutate very easily. In fact, you know, Actocytologica has an issue where, where um, Kate Kusheri, myself, and Belinda from my lab wrote a piece, uh, The Future of HPV Research, Where Should We Go the Next 10 Years? It doesn't have a very good impact factor. It used to be a preeminent journal, but it actually funnily shows you how far cytology has fallen, which is sad, um, because it was a preeminent journal. And the title of that special issue is HPV, the Dinosaur Virus. It was with us millions and millions of years ago. Um, it's a very ancient viral family, and it doesn't mutate much. You're thinking of HIV, HTLV. RNA viruses, of course, mutate like crazy. Uh, but certain DNA viruses mutate very, very little. 